This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So I'm wondering, maybe you can start the, thusly. Um, if you're a college student who's never been to the New Beverly Cinema or a rep house, mm -hmm. I know you've obviously described it in the movie and all of your interviews very eloquently did so, but can you explain just what is the difference between going to a multiplex here in town or even seeing something in the Pollock? Like what is really the, the sort of um, visceral difference of a rep house versus even a college screening? Um, I think it's because it's the intention of the audience, really. It's like the audience wants to be there. I mean, if you go to see Fifty Shades of Grey or something, like, do people really want to see it? Kind of, not really. Like, it's not really a thing, but it's something like mid midnight movies. Like, that's why, like, you love to go see Rocky Horror Picture Show is because you have these people who are out at midnight and really excited to see this movie. And I feel like rip houses have that kind of midnight movie feel all the time, where, like, everybody's super into it. And I think it just when you have a whole audience excited to see something, it, it transforms the movie into a thing that's more than just images on a screen. It kind of is a feeling in a room, which is all weird and hokey and six sensey, but that's kind of what it is. Do you have uh, specific memories of films like during this di transition to digital, mm -hmm. where, or even before then, when you were trying desperately to get a print and there, you just couldn't find one, you or Sherman spent weeks trying to locate a print, and how does this, uh, this whole transition to digital, the universal film fire, the disinterest of the studios to distribute prints, how did all this come out about at the New Beverly? Um, well, the, there's always, I mean, there's always prints that, I mean, hypothetically, it'll be easier to get films on digital. But as we said in the film, you lose stuff all the time. So whether or not you'll be able to get it is anybody's guess. I mean, there was always 35 millimeter prints that we wanted that we couldn't necessarily get. So you have that option, but then also you're also losing stuff. So that's kind of the problem. Um, I've always, I always wanted to show Heathers and uh, there was never a print of Heathers, which is weird because it's kind of a major movie and it was just never existed. So if, if you couldn't find Heathers, would Sherman make a decision to show it on DVD? No. Um, we, we, when Sherman was alive, we only showed 35. And we only had a digital projector at the New Beverly very briefly for about like six months. And then it was gone again. And it's back to 35 millimeter only forever and ever. Amen. Mm. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the actual programming process. Um, because that's obviously a fascinating part of the film, at least the first part of the film, is how particular combinations of films are put together and then the events that emerge in reaction to the programs that right. are put together. Was that simply um, Sherman's decisions or was it a, a common discussion among the various people who worked there and once an idea of a film being shown uh, presented, then did that spin off other creative ideas among the entire crew? Yeah, I mean, uh, Sherman and Michael, when Michael took over, did the majority of the programming, but there was, always, there was always a film suggestion book in the lobby, so if the audience has a suggestion, they could put it in, and he tried, they both tried very hard to accommodate those. And then we always got to do um, different screenings as well. So it was always really interesting because you would, you know, everybody who works there has a slightly different taste in film. So you'd be like, oh, this is clearly Matt picked this or Marion picked this, you know, and we all kind of bring out those movies that we've wanted somebody to see. And so you get this kind of really interesting, um, I was going to say tapestry, but that makes me sound really douchey, um, really e interesting selection of, of films to, to watch. So. And then the promotion of it. I mean, obviously, there's the famous flyer, which is iconic um, in repertory cinema history. Um, but were there particular strategies that were developed for promoting particular series? Or was there just a, a loyal clientele that you know that you'd be drawing on no matter what you showed? Well, we, I mean, it's a little bit of both. I mean, sometimes, like, if you show, like, a, you know, if you're having a Wes Anderson double feature, you're going to get, you know, a lot of younger people. But a, we, we really just um, relied on the, the regulars who would come every night and you know it was really cute because like we had this old couple that would come almost every night regardless of what we're showing they just want to be there they have nothing better to do and uh, they came out once and we were showing Antichrist 
and I had to be like, um, you guys, like, this is a good movie, but it's really brutal, and it's really, you know, it's really graphic. And they were like, well, thank you. For, we're going to take a chance. And I'm like, good for you. <laughs> and like halfway through, like, I can hear it starting to get really bad. And they came out, and they're like, not for us. But, they, you know, <laughs> and I was like, that's cool that they're just like, yeah. you know what, we're just going to give it a try. And I was like, that's awesome. So yeah. it's like, it, you know, the, the clientele is always just this crazy group of people, but they all somehow get along. It's very, very... Um, inspiring, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. I think this notion of the clientele and the regulars is probably something that most people, who, again, who haven't gone to rep houses or to museum screenings where these kinds of groups uh, coagulate, if you will, and then uh, become a kind of fixture in certain seats. I mean, the right. clue is a good example. <laughs> but So what's that like? I mean, in other words, uh, because I once read this uh, fantastic account of the Lowe's New York, which was not a rep house, of course, it's in the 20s. People would come every single day. They changed the program every day. And if someone didn't show up, they assumed they were sick or dead. So is that a kind of thing in the New Beverly, yeah. like, oh, such and such isn't here. Maybe he's been killed. Yes. Yes, it is, actually. Um, was that me? Is that you? OK. okay. Um, there was a guy who I was trying really, really hard to get in the movie, and I couldn't find him. And we called him Scary Gary because he was a pyromaniac, and he had, at some point, in a explosion, blown off all the fingers on one hand and an eye. And then he had kind of like gotten into it and was like, yeah, I'm going to be the scary guy now. And so like he like grew his hair all dark, and it was all like long and like lanky. And he always smoked cigars, and he was always trying to sell me drugs. Like he came in once and he asked me if I wanted cocaine and like asked me if I wanted morphine and like asked me if I want to buy a gun and like that kind of stuff. And um, he was kind of delightful in like this really horrifying way. And then we didn't see him forever. And I was like, oh, he's definitely dead. Like, because he was like talking about how he's going to like knock off a 7 Eleven. Um, and then I saw him like walking, walking somewhere one day. And I was like, oh my God, he's alive. And so like it was that thing where like I was so used to seeing him frequently that I just assume. And yeah, it's kind of sad because we have like, you know, the old guys who like suddenly don't come anymore. And you're like, I hope that he's okay. Mm -hmm. But. You know I mean, mean, there are obviously people who spend more time at the New Beverly than anywhere else. Yeah. You know, they're either home or yeah, at the New Beverly. Yeah, I wonder, like, what are you doing when you're not here? Because I just can't picture it. Because mm -hmm. they're just, I only see, it's like when you see a teacher when they're, like, you know, in the grocery store and you're like, ah, <laughs> reality and fantasy are blurring. <laughs> we, we do shop at grocery stores. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Well, one of the great things about the community also is the notion of its intergenera intergenerational dimension. and. Um, it, it cuts across all kinds of stereotypes about what each generation might want or not want. Um, and uh, it, it's lovely captured in the, uh, in the documentary itself, how people speak so fondly about people of other ages and other, other values. I want to talk a little bit about the documentary itself, too, because this is your first film, mm -hmm. right? And uh, at some point, um, I know you had to learn the ropes in making the film, but it is so marvelously structured oh, in terms of the movement from getting to know the community and then and the humor in that, but also the sadness with the death of, of Sherman and then moving into the last section where the, the really most important larger implications of it are explored in some way. Could you talk a bit about that? What was your original impulse in making the film and how mm -hmm. that changed over the course of making the film? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, made, I did the petition and the petition went really well and there was so much support and I had always wanted to make a documentary about the New Beverly because it's just an awesome place. Um, and this seemed like the right time and so I launched Kickstarter and I raised $80,000 on Kickstarter in 30 days. So I'm proof that it works, and it's cool because I own it, and um, I don't owe anybody any money. So for young filmmakers, it's incredible and highly recommended. Um, so I did a Kickstarter, and then um, we, f we started filming less than a month later and did most of the interviews in uh, two weeks. And then we did a little trip to London for the Prince Charles, and then came back and edited it. Um, and the editing's especially for a documentary is hard because you're basically forming the story yourself. And we had like 60 hours of footage and a lot of it's amazing because you have Mark Romanek just like going on about film and I will just sit here and listen to him talk forever. So, you know, we, we were able to get it down to, you know, this is 86 minutes and then it's been really interesting, you know, just as a first, film, first time filmmaker to just go through every process and see how it works because, you know, I think it's important for first time directors to ask for help because I think a lot of first-time filmmakers 
get really uppity about it, like, oh, I have to prove I'm the boss and I have to show like I'm the director. And mm -hmm. I think it's much more useful to you and your crew to ask their opinions and ask for help and you know get everybody's because it's a, it is a collaborative process and I think like it feels weird to me to say like I directed this movie this is my movie because there's so many people that worked on it that made it possible um, did that answer your question yeah no it does and um, <laughs> did it end up being different than what you imagined it would be at the beginning yes um, and even now I think you know watching so this was it was locked two years ago now, in 2013. And so I look at it now and there's changes that I wanna make that I'm like, oh, why did I keep that line? Or like, oh, this is going on too long in this place or whatever, but it's interesting because I think, because we shot half digital and half 35 and then you know we have this 35 millimeter print and if you're only on digital, like you can kind of re-edit forever because there's no like real version, but I have a 35 millimeter print that I'm locked into now. So like, this is the movie, I can't make any changes. And so it's interesting that you have this kind of like finality of it with the print. But you know, I'm so, I'm so incredibly grateful that I have a print. I'm just still kind of shell-shocked that that happened. I think the, uh, maybe I'll ask one more question before we turn it over to questions. The, the um, curator who I forget, that, uh, the Prince Charles, mentioned this idea of the romance of film, mm -hmm. about 35 millimeter. What's your sense of things now? What's the future of film? What's the future of the New Beverly and these kind of rep houses? Uh, well, you want my romantic answer or do you want my logical answer? <laughs> I want your logical answer. Okay, mm -hmm. my logical answer, I don't know. I mean, I can hope for the best, um, but you know, if the future generations aren't interested in watching movies on a big screen, then that kills it, you know, and it's already kind of dying as it is, and I think, that's why I wanted. I felt so pressed to make this movie now because I feel like it's kind of the last gasp. And if we we can still save it, but if this generation gives up on it, then it's gone. You know, and like living like every time I hear about a theater closing, like I personally am like, oh, like I failed, like I didn't save it, and I feel like it's such an important thing. Um, but you know, my romantic answer is that there'll always be people to save it you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, because I don't want to live in a place, in a world that doesn't have revival cinema. It's depressing. <laughs> was the, before we open it up, was, was the campaign that you launched successful in your mind, and is that a prototype for other kinds of campaigns that might be used in behalf of the cause more broadly? The petition or the Kickstarter? The, 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 the petition, I was thinking of the petition, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, when I started it, I kind of, I knew, I was like, oh, well, this isn't really going to make a difference. Like, what kind of difference can it make? Because I'm just one person and like, but getting 10,000 signatures and getting it picked up by all this press and getting people talking about something's really important. And I think I'm proud that I did that. And I'm proud that I have a film about a subject that I'm really passionate in, about. And like, whether, you know, I don't know, whether or not it's a good movie, I don't know. I think it's okay, you know, for a first film it's pretty okay, so um, I'm just hoping that, you know, my goal with the film is people to see it and say, I wanna watch things on 35, and I wanna go to these places that are, you know, these really cool places that are dying, um, and support them. Okay. All right, what questions you guys got? So you, the Kodak um, emblem is on the film. Yes. And I'd like to know more about how you got the stock okay. and what it was like to, to deal with that now that the tombstone is being erected over that I have sort to, of thing. Okay, well, that's a great question. And I will tell you that it was a complete delight um, and a surprise. And when I started out making, to make the film, I had no, I'd never even really considered filming on 35 because I just didn't think it was an option. Um, and then uh, I emailed Panavision and I told them about the film I was making and they were super generous and they gave me a, a gigantic camera package and Kodak just gave me boxes of film. And because I think because the movie fights so hard for it, they were really excited about it. And so then um, I've been working with the moving image archivists that work out of the New York Public Library and they uh, know the people at Deluxe and Photochem who made me this 35 millimeter print and you know they gave me a stupid discount like it was amazing and mm. so you know I'm just excited to be an example that it's still possible like I just did this and I have a print and it's there so don't think that it's not possible and if it's something that you feel strongly about then ask the worst they can say is no but they might say yes and if you're lucky you can get a 35 millimeter print which is pretty bitchin in my opinion 
Um, is there like main distributor you go to to find the 35 millimeter prints or do you just like look around or how do you usually collect those? Uh, like the New Beverly, how do they book yeah. them? Um, you just book them through the actual studios and that's why it's such a problem is because if the studios want to withhold, withhold the prints, they can because they're theirs. Um, private collecting is technically illegal because they're, those are movies that are owned by studios but sometimes they end up being the only place that you can go to find a print because sometimes if the studios have destroyed it or lost it or there was a fire or whatever, then like there's you know they these people had these prints, um, and I think the the studios are just being. Um, I mean, it's not. I guess it's not surprising that they're very money focused. That you know, for me, like digital. Once it, I mean, at one point, at some point, digital will look like 35. I'm, it'll get there, but it's just not there now. So I wonder why go ahead and do this when you're actually backtracking to a less beautiful format. I think that's really weird. Um, so recently, I think two weeks ago, uh, there were two or three major motion picture studios who signed an agreement with Kodak saying that they'd continue to archive their film or yeah, their movies on film. Mm -hmm. Um, which was kind of groundbreaking in like keeping film alive. Um, I was wondering if you guys had any like direct role in that kind of motion in that contract or anything like that. I mean, I personally don't. Uh, my mom likes to think that I do, but I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, but you know, but Quentin did, you know, and he was one of the people to stand up and say it. And I, you know, and I think that it's so cool that he's able to use his celebrity for good cause and to stand up for a really important thing and to save a theater that's going to die and to be saying like 35 millimeters important and to really stand up and I think that's really cool that he did that you know along with P.T. Anderson and Chris Nolan and all those guys who it's awesome because they're awesome but no I had nothing to do with that I wish I did. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your film a lot of us in film studies are concerned with the issues of preservation and archiving but you made it really fun and quirky and engaging and idiosyncratic in a way that I don't know how to do, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, my question is, if you were on death row and you had to program your last film festival, which films as a director and as a film geek would you absolutely need to have in there? Nice. That's what I'm talking about. I want exciting questions. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, OK, uh, well, my favorite movie of all time is The Breakfast Club. And that's because it proves that all you need is a great director and great writing and great actors to make a great film. Um, so I would definitely show that. Um, I love uh, Baz Luhrmann, so I'd do some Moulin Rouge. Um, how many, I, you said a film festival, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, <laughs> probably Harold and Maude, uh, Masculine Feminine, Holy Mountain, The Apple, Xanadu, Rocky Horror Picture Show. My tastes kind of go all over the map. Um, that's a good question. Now I really, I, I'd say like The Breakfast Club would probably be the last one and then they'd leave me off to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have never been to New Beverly, but um, I want to go off to say this. And I feel like it's like um, a neighborhood cinema, like only to the community. And I'm interested in if you ever like promote it, the, the cinema or the movie that you show to like not only to the local, or you want to just keep it local? Like no, I mean, I, I mean, it's we have a. I mean, there's a website and everything, and and. But it's 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 mainly. I mean, I don't know. People come from all over the world. I guess I have I've had friends who've come to visit and wanted to come. It's like, like me wanting to go to the Prince Charles. Like you know, once you start looking, deeper into this revival cinema world, you just get kind of sucked in. You're like, oh, there's this one in Belgium that's amazing, and there's this one in New Zealand, and like, they're all over the place. And so I think, like, I would like to do a vacation where you just kind of, just kind of like do revival cinema. And there's a great website that I got a lot of information called, from called Cinema Treasures that has all of the theaters listed. Also, for you film students, all of that, um, so the little like, let's all go to the lobby things, those are called snipes. And I got all of those from Internet Archive. Write this down. Mm -hmm. Internet Archive, which is an amazing website, which is all public domain. All of these clips in here from Plan 9 from Outer Space and Freaks and uh, Night of the Living Dead and everything, those are all public domain. Um, so you can use them to your advantage. So check those out. They're really cool. Can you run nitrate at the New Beverly? No.
The Nitrates run only, I believe, in Los Angeles at the Bridges Theater at UCLA. I don't think the Academy does it anymore, and Bridges barely ever does it. Um, so it's pretty much, if you ever see a Nitrate show, and I assume you're asking because you have, <laughs> um, it's something that you have to see. I mean, it actually transcends even this conversation when you see Nitrate. Mm. It's Did a kind of luminescence that's just unbelievable. Could you tell a difference watching this that this was 35? Yes? Good. Mm. Okay. Would I uh, be correct uh, in my assumption that your demographic at the New Beverly, your audience, sort of uh, embraces the concept of green scratches through the prints and maybe slightly off uh, changeovers? And I'm, I'm thinking of my, my, I have a teenage daughter who probably has never seen a 35 millimeter print, and I don't know that uh, the generation that's growing up is groomed for or accustomed to sort of those flaws inherent, inherent in those old prints. Well, the, I mean, for me personally, like, I feel like, especially because there's a grindhouse night that they do twice monthly at the New Beverly, and for me, like, if you're going to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you should watch it on a print that's like really scratched and messed up because like that <laughs> makes it even worse. Like the, the thing that's so scary about Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that it looks bad and it sounds bad and it's like all like you know it looks real and I think like you know in certain movies like that like that kind of helps like everything's kind of messed up and but no I think that you know the New Beverly projectionists try hard to make sure that things go well I mean there's human error but that's part of the charm I feel like because you know probably most of you have never thought about a projectionist before right like you don't because you just like their job like they said like their jobs to be invisible so you just don't even think about it but actually projectionists are a really important person because they're there up there watching this movie making sure that it's okay you know so the you know we try to do the best projecting possible i guess anybody does but i i kind of like the mistakes honestly so do you still work at the Beverly, or has like Tarantino completely taken over, or what's the deal? Um, I was fired from the New Beverly. <clears throat> I know, right? You make a movie about a place, and they fire you. Um, <laughs> it, but it actually, um, nothing to do with Tarantino, and I still think he's awesome. His assistant, not so much. Um, so it's kind of, it's just, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> It's very weird because, you know, this was a place that I had kind of always expected to be at, and, and I think my love for it is, is obvious in the film. Um, and now it kind of gives the film like a melancholy air that it didn't have before. It used to be very celebratory, and now it's kind of like, oh, it's this place that doesn't really exist anymore. So it feels weird, but I also feel like because the film has this greater message of like, you know, it's not just about this theater, it's about all of these theaters. That's why I still think it's important to show because it's, I think it's just people don't know. And it's a really cool thing. And like if you, you know, grow up in, in a place where you have that, like you should use it because it's going to make your film making better. Okay, I have one specific question, and it follows up on this, this question that was just asked, and it's about okay. the changeover. And I'm just wondering whether you kind of marked the changeovers in the film, because there are these really shocking moments. And yeah. I wondered about that reflexive element. Okay, well, I'll just start with that specific question. Um, the, okay, so our changeovers, it's complicated, but because we went from a digital to a 35 millimeter print, the changeovers aren't, because usually they're done in like, when you're switching to a new shot, so they're less jarring. But because of how ours was made, like our cue marks are just kind mm. of in the middle of sentences, oh. the projectionists all hate it, and I'm sorry for that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's I mean they, um, yeah, it's kind of kind of a pain. But 35 millimeter print, yeah. <laughs> but I loved it. I thought it, 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 since this film is about you know 35 millimeter film and all its proclivities and its yeah. scratches, to also to show the changes over overs and. Have them not oh, see, I so totally sweet. did it on I, purpose. I, I thought yes. you were doing, yeah, I really thought you were doing that on purpose. But, then, but I had another question, which is, um, I, I thought the film was really great and complex because it was an autobiographical documentary and of a community. And then it was this, this history of a place in a city going through the history of the Beverly when it was, before it was the new Beverly, when it was a porn house, mm -hmm. and then, um, there were so many other elements, the archival element that Chuck mentioned, and then there's this, this international or this global element. And so 
my I was just thinking, what could be another film? And I was thinking, what about a repertory house in a neighborhood in Tokyo or something like that? And so I, my question for you is, what are the three or four more films that you were dying to make because of making this one and because of all the other angles that you couldn't pursue because mm. it was so well focused and woven together? Well, that's a great question. Well, we were talking about uh, before, we, we had dinner before, and we were talking about, um, I think it would be cool to do something that's like a, a television show basically where like you go to different rep repertory houses and each yeah. episode's about a different cinema. Mm -hmm. So it'd be like a mini, like out of print, but like this is this one in Tokyo and this is this one in New York. So mm -hmm. sounds great, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I only had the money to make it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I, think it's a cool, I think it's a cool topic and not really something that people are talking about yet, but they should be. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the exhibition of the film, whether it got shown in the New Beverly, and if it's been shown in other such theaters, and how it's been received by the people in the film and um, people in other theaters like it. Thanks. Um, uh, it has. It was, it was never shown at the New Beverly. It was meant to have a big premiere there, and it was going to be perfect, right? Because it's like everybody who's there knows like all the in jokes and everything, and that never happened. So that was really sad. But. Um, I showed it at the Crest in Westwood, and then I just did this little East Coast tour of uh, some colleges. I did Emerson, Amherst, and Wellesley, um, and I think it was the same kind of reaction that I'm getting, where the, you know it's nice to see what 35 millimeter looks like, and it's cool to see it side by side, and then also you know to think about these theaters that. Um, could be near you that you might want to try out. And then I have, um, coming up in March, it's playing in the Netherlands, crazily enough. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's also, it's doing, it's hopping around. It's gonna be in Washington, New Mexico, Kansas, and Texas. Um, but these are all things, like again, because I, I'm doing, like I've made this movie pretty much by myself. I raised the money, I did the you know directing, and then like got it through, and now I'm trying to negotiate distributing which I know nothing about. So I'm trying my hardest to like kind of do what I'm doing, but I'm just sending out um, stuff myself. So this is something that like, I feel like if you want to, if you feel passionate enough about something, like you can make it happen. There's another dimension to this that I think is important to remember too, is that a film like this potentially inspires other people to start theaters. Right. Or to save theaters, too. Yeah. So beyond it's the personal memoir, I guess that's what Janet was thinking of as well. It's an autobiography, it's a social history, but it also has much wider implications. I think that's part of the brilliance of the film. So Thank you. you should um, take great heart in that. Well, I think we should really thank yeah. Julia yeah. for a tremendous film and a great night. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>